postmodernism. And he's also published recent articles on the Saturday Evening Post covers for American Art Journal and also on the 1930s genre painting revival um, in the journal The Space Between. He is currently working on a book on early 20th century American genre painting. John's talk this afternoon is Fraternal Hazing and Other Violent Rituals. A cheery topic. Hey. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Fraternal Hazing and Other Violent Rituals. An array of hijinks and humiliations compressed into a tight pyramid where somebody strut and strain while others crumple and submit. A buoyant tone that finds its keynote in the figure flung haphazard from the sheet, but also intensity and aggression, jarring intersecting lines, a profusion of baseball bats and sticks wielded as weapons. In a February 1912 letter to his former Ohio State professor, Joseph Russell Taylor, Bellows describes this little drawing as, my memory of being initiated into the frat with some slapstick humor. A picture of some 30 or 40 more or less college looking boys playing hell with the freshy initiates on the lawn in front of the chapter house. There is no attempt at correct setting either in clothes or locality, and the only interest is in the humor of the action. Initially identifying the work's theme as collegiate pranks, Robert Conway's recent catalog essay offers a biographical explanation for the sense that there's a little more than this at stake. Bellow's image of fraternal uh, initiation, as Robert puts it, conflates the pain of his initial rejection as a freshman and the joy of his acceptance as a sophomore in Beta Theta Pi at Ohio State University in 1901-1902. This paper expands on that sense of this as a bittersweet, conflicted memory to think more broadly about what the experience and memory of fraternal hazing meant to Bellows and to his art. Bellows attended Ohio State in the period when, as Woodrow Wilson put it during his tenure as president of Princeton, the, the sideshows were so numerous, so diverting, so important, if you will, that they've swallowed up the circus. These sideshows, the fraternal sporting and social life of the campus, were also becoming increasingly prominent in mainstream culture, marked, for example, by the Saturday Evening Post college man number of June 6, 1903. On the cover, J.J. Gould's confident type models college trends and affectations. Inside, editor George Horace Lorimer, who had previously questioned the value of college education in his old Gorgon Graham letters, declared in a column headed Poor Richard's Junior Philosophy that most self-made men would put in a college education if they had to do the job over again. Children of the growing urban business and professional classes were, according to Woodrow Wilson, being sent to college so that they could make connections and establish net social networks for themselves and for the families who were paying for their educations. The Post regularly carried college life stories by Jesse Lynch Williams, which, along with popular series such as Owen Johnson's Stover at Yale novels and George Fitch's tales of fictional Midwestern Suwatch College, formed a world where academic pursuits were or suggested a world where academic pursuits were secondary to equipping oneself with the social skills and social set necessary for bourgeois life and professional managerial employment. If Bellow's mother's hope that he would become a Methodist minister doesn't quite fit that pattern, his father's assumption that his son would follow him into architecture or contracting does. Moreover, Bellows was an active participant in the sideshow, distraught at not being bid for a fraternity as a freshman, then embracing Beta Theta Phi when they're given the opportunity, starring on the baseball and basketball teams and singing in the glee club, participating in the popular myth and image making of college life by producing dozens of illustrations for the 1903 and 1904 Macchio yearbooks in his sophomore and junior years. Art historians have treated these contributions to the yearbook only in passing, identifying them as Charles Dana Gibson imitations, and although this one doesn't work in that way, many of them do, and dismissing them with Robert Henry's classroom put down, haven't I seen these somewhere before? While no doubt derivative and juvenilia, these illustrations reveal an immersion in college life and a more sophisticated understanding of that experience than the simple replication of Gibson's idealized types might imply. Similarly, Bellow's college experiences have been appeared to most commentators as less compelling, less important formative experiences than Henry's classroom and the teeming streets of New York. Indeed, Bellow's own account of the encounter, own account of the encounter with Henry corroborates this sense that what went before could be easily erased from salient history. My brains were as innocent as co a college could make them. My life begins at this point, the rest is legend. 
attention to, I remember, complicates this story, suggesting connections between seemingly disparate elements of Bellow's life and art. Just as Bellow's urban scenes are shaped by the comic and caricatured iconographies of city life, I remember, with its compression of incidents, deployment of college types, and sprinkling of slapstick, presents a scene quite consciously recorded, I think, through the lenses of college popular culture. Several stories in George Fitch's 1911 collection uh, at good old Suwach employ the familiar college fiction device of the reminiscing narrator. Let's quote from that um, one of these stories. Honest Bill, sometimes when I sit down in these sober plug away days, when we are kind to the poor dumb policemen and don't dare wear straw hats after the first of September and think about the good old college times, I wonder where we had the nerve to imitate insanity the way we did. Here I am, rubbing noses at thir with 30, outgrowing my belts every year, and sitting eight hours at a desk without exploding. Am I the chap who climbed up 60 feet of water spout a few years ago and persuaded the clapper of the college bell to come down with me? Are you the loafer who spent all one night getting a profane parrot into the cold air pipes of the college chapel? When he made I Remember in February 1912, Bellows was recently married and started a family, was rubbing noses with 30 and plugging away at his profession. The drawing could certainly be taken in much the same nostalgic spirit as Fitch's Reverie, its canopied lawn and chapter house porch and Arcadian sphere apart from academic strictures and the stuff of the wider world. But it also suggests a different, worldlier discourse of fraternal pranks and initiation rituals that found expression in early 20th century popular fictions and exposés of, of college life. In Jesse Lynch Williams' 1899 novel, Adventures of a Freshman, the protagonist, Deacon Young, a big, awkward-looking Midwesterner, is hazed by seniors at Princeton who are shown to be taking advantage of the supposedly light-hearted rituals to mask cruel bullying and sadistic humiliation. William's story accords with a strain of sensationalist journalism that cast fraternal hazing as the dirty secret of the nation's universities and as a dangerous, even criminal, enterprise. Julian Hawthorne's 1905 Muncie's Magazine article titled The Crime of Hazing exemplifies such claims. While acknowledging that initiation rituals were th in thriving condition during his time at Harvard in the 1860s, Hawthorne reports that college hazing has never before been so prevalent as now. It was never so disgusting and inhuman in character. Hawthorne ca catalogues recent fatalities, horrific injuries, and instances of torture, including brutal hazing leading to concussions and broken jaws, freshmen stripped and rubbed with coarse sandpaper or forced to endure freezing temperatures, and the electrocution after the approved Sing Sing method of a freshman in Oakland who was left paralyzed. A report of this incident in the San Francisco call suggests that Hawthorne's cases were perhaps exaggerated for effect. The student, according to the report, was left weak and in nervous shock, but not paralyzed, but that they had at least some basis, in fact. I remember contains nothing so extreme as the examples Hawthorne lists, but on close inspection, there are several instances in which hazing is shown to be something other than mere high-spirited pranks. In front of the steps, a freshman holds a contorted headstand. Slapstick, perhaps, in its echo of kindergarten games, but the coercion of a thick-set supervisor akin also to, um, makes it akin to what we know in the too, contemporary, to, 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 the too familiar contemporary vocabulary of torture as a stress position. These figures. Besides these figures, a youth crouches prone, submitting his buttocks to a bat swung with forceful relish. Other but buttocks retreat up a foreground tree, pursued somewhat awkwardly by a bespectacled youth who, amid the sticks and bats, wields a specially fashioned paddle. The use of such weapons of corporal punishment was, at the time, Bellows made his drawing among the concerns of progressive campaigns for penal reform. At the top of the compositional pyramid um, swings a body from a rope slung across a tree branch in a presumably mock hanging indeed lynching. A body, uh, bottom left, a fraternity man places his foot in the nape of an initiate's neck. His cane on the base of his skull, the concentrated downward pressure asserted by the cruel, rigid lines of the hazer's body and the spread, clawing, imploring fingers of the hazed convey sadism and desperation. The violence here is both morally and historically freighted. While his letter to Joseph Taylor seems to downplay these aspects of hazing by insisting that the only interest in the picture 
lies in the slapstick humour of the action. Bellow's plan for displaying the drawing and his anticipation of its reception hints at a more complex meaning. Bellow sent a cut made from the drawing to the Macchio, the college yearbook, um, which was published in 1912 um, without fanfare or acknowledgement that Bellows was a celebrated alumnus, and then presented the original drawing to Taylor. Imagining the way that the drawing might, would be received, Bellows tells Taylor, I hope you will like it. In fact, I was thinking of you and a few others as audience rather than the general student public. This sense of a private joke communicated through the pages of the Macchio is accentuated by Bellows' insertion of himself into the scene. And again, this is a strategy that we've seen at various points before. Among the elegant spectators depicted in the painting crowd at Polo made two years before this drawing, Rebecca Zuria picks out a figure who stands at the far right edge um, of the group in the foreground, his lanky physique, Rebecca writes, his long nose, the dangling cigarette, and the bald dome just visible beneath the helmet all mark him as bellows. A wry, questioning glance further sets him apart from the rest of the crowd. Occupying the exact same spot in the composition with a college man's pipe re replacing a, the, a rather than a cigarette and with the domed head covered by the same askew cap in which he posed for his yearbook baseball team portrait, Bellows places himself at the margins of I Remember. His position of right attachment creates a distance from which artists and like-minded viewers might question the motives of those involved and look askance at the urges unleashed and the attitudes inculcated by fraternal hazing. Julian Hawthorne concludes his Muntz's article by demanding can you imagine any pra practice more certain to degrade the manhood and destroy the self-respect of both hazers and hazed? What else, than a, what else than a school of bullying, cowardice, and falsehood can hazing be? Contributing, contributors to a 1913 survey of college presidents found that the rushing system and the castes that followed afterwards were cruel and undesirable in a system of education designed to foster ideals of democracy. In his 1915 book, The Fraternity in the College, Thomas Arkell Clark quotes an unnamed informant who explains that if the freshmen could fully comprehend the significance of fraternity ties, horseplay would be unnecessary. But he cannot do this, and more material means are necessary. The so-called roughhouse is a means of determining what a man possesses. That Bellows himself was aware that hazing was about bullying exclusivity and testing masculinity is apparent in those biographical accounts that detail his disappointment at not being bid as a freshman, and in his but also, I think, in his contribution to the 1904 Macchio captioned, one of the freshman war heroes. Um, the text underneath reads, one of the crowd. Are you one of them guys that got thrown into the lake? Smoyer, testily. No, I'm one of those men. The bunch, oh, come on, give me some of your Smoyer talk. This exchange pits the lone Smoyer against the voice of the group and against doubts about, about his claim to masculinity. In another illustration made for the same yearbook, Bellows shows the loneliness, anxiety, and humiliation that were central to the hazing process and that defined the experience for those outside or seeking entry into fraternities. Historian Nicholas Syrup puts these early 20th century accounts of the fraternity system into a broader context. Drawing on the work of Irving Goffman and Pierre Bourdieu, Syrett characterizes fraternities as training grounds for the middle and upper class and, and for the middle and upper class and vehicles for the perpetuation of those classes and as powerful agents of conformity. Rushing and hazing were a means of enforcing a narrow, pernicious, and exclusive class identity, of policing and bolstering masculinity at a time when, as Syrett argues, fraternity men increasingly define their ma masculinity through athletic success, extracurricular activity, wealth, and finally, whiteness. Might something like this understanding of hazing rituals have been what Bellows, who chafed at much that he encountered at college and in his early life, surrounded by Methodists and Republicans, communicated in, I remember being initiated into the frat, to Joseph Taylor, a literature professor once described as the sympathetic confessor for all brave spirits at Ohio State. Bellows' New York City art is often viewed as the work of an outsider looking in through lenses that include popular and reform media on a life apart from his own. Marion Dozima, Rebecca Zuria, and others have given powerful and persuasive accounts of the way that newspaper journalism and comic caricatures such as The Yellow Kid shape Bellows' representation of street and working class life. But as this pastiche made for the 1904 Macchio helps us see, Bellows may have also recognized something of himself and of his own class in The Yellow Kid and, the other, uh, and, and on the streets of Lower Manhattan. 
Bellows borrows Richard Oak, um, cartoonist Richard Alcott's one-point perspective street scene, the grinning, grinning gap-toothed juggiered protagonist. So he's here, and obviously the yellow kid here. Um, and techniques of visual overload and inserted verbal gags to imagine a future 1912 visit of the Ohio State University football team to their local rivals, Ohio Wesleyan University. Kill the gatekeeper. They're setting fire to the building. Show no mercy. References, kind of visual references scattered to the, um, the football team's uh, name, the, the, the Wahoos, um, to their battle song. That, uh, celebrates that, 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 that nickname. Um, youths in medieval armor, Wild West costume and blackface deploy pitchforks, belching cannon and red paint in their assault on Delaware, Ohio. The, perhaps tapping into some local rivalries here. Um, the violence again ritualized, and the violence is again ritualized and historically freighted. A grinning boy to the left of the scene conducts a mock, mock scalping and tied to specifically to the assertion of fraternal and collegial identity. Red is OSU's um, color. A prone OWU student is captioned, died for his color. There are, I think, two distinct ways of reading this contrib comic contribution as it appeared in the Macchio. It might imply that by 1912, the yellow kid will have grown up and gone to college. The scenario alludes to cartoons in which Alcott had the uh, Hogan's Alley gang invade middle-class homes to terrorize well-behaved children or subvert reputable pastimes such as baseball and golf. In Bellow's cartoon, the rituals that allowed college men to run riot with certain parameters have been usurped by second-generation immigrants oblivious to those borders. Syrett, in his um, history of, of college fraternities, identifies this fear as an increasingly significant factor in the institutionalization and increasingly rigid policing of fraternal exclusivity. By the end of the 19th century, he argues, with the arrival of ethnic and racial minorities at colleges and universities, Fraternities were much more self-consciously concerned with their whiteness and their Christianity. In 1904, Bellows may have himself harbored such fears or else set out to play on and thus satirize their hold on his contemporaries. A second way to understand the pastiche is as a conflation of fraternal and sporting culture with the carnivalesque abandonment of civilized behavior that characterized Alcott's comic and the wider society saw in New York's marauding street children. On this reading, the sanction of violence and misrule ritualized by fraternal and sporting culture has so loosened the constraints placed on Midwestern college, middle class college men that they take on the traits of the working class immigrant other. Julian Hawthorne's Crime of Hazing article repeatedly makes this asso association, asserting, for example, that hazers emulate the brutality, cruelty, and cowardice of the hoodlum gangs of our slums. Bellu's Bellows' wahoos, like Jonathan Swift's yahoos, reveal the base condition that lies beneath the veneer of civility. A little over two years after he made his yearbook contribution, Bellows, now relocated to Manhattan and enrolled in Henry's class at the New York School of Art, made the crayon drawing election night Times Square. In his recent catalogue essay, Sean Willents rightly identifies Bellows' observation of the November, 19, uh, November 6, 1906 election celebrations and his subsequent rendering of them in this dynamic, lively composition as a formative experience, as a wellspring for themes that would turn up often much sharpened in later work. But while the setting and scale may have been relatively new to Bellows, how much of a revelation were the, vi the wild, violent festivities of Times Square? Willens hones in on the illuminated foreground section of the crowd where tattered, bedraggled, unsupervised kids gather and where a phalanx of men in Indian file crashes into the crowd. Bellow's depiction accords with reports published in the New York Times the following day which describe turbulence and even some violence erupting amid the Mardi Gras-like revelries that had become associated with election night. Gangs of young sports rushed about, knocked people over, and hit old men and old women over the head with tin horns, reported the Times. And later, gangs formed two lines, forced pedestrians to pass between them, began knocking off hats and tearing overcoats, and then pummeling, sometimes severely, anyone who objected. While these scenes certainly constitute an initiation into big city life and an early glimpse of an unfamiliar urban working class culture, Bellow's experiences at Ohio State had already taught him something about rough play and about the violent impulses unleashed when ritual suspends the normal rules of conduct. This illustration, 
made in 1903 by William Glackens to accompany a story in the Post's College Man number, suggests the ways in which techniques for representing the violent, tumultuous crash of intersecting bodies, often associated with Ashkan school art, and the details from the, 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 the image, um, could find purchase in the bodies of college men and be applied to incidents of college of campus life. Motifs and techniques echo back and forth between Bellows' Macchio Yellow Kid illustration, his early scenes of street life like election night Times Square and 42 Kids, and his later recollection of initiation into the frat. For Willentz, election night Times Square is peopled with brutish, excitement-seeking New Yorkers of the kind who frequented places such as Tom Sharkey's Athletic Club and is thus connected to the paintings, including Staggart Sharkey's, seen several times now, um, that Bellows made following his visit to semi-legal boxing matches. These paintings, like the street scenes, tend to be understood as the work of an artist looking in on a world apart from his own, looking in on a ring whose rules he did not know and an underworld crowd of unfamiliar faces, looking at fighters across divisions of class and experience. But like the street scenes and the boxing pictures, and sorry, but, but like the street scenes, the boxing pictures also have some grounding in Bellows' own life. Basketball was among the, group, the first group of drawings Bellows exhibited. It was shown at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in March 1906, and so predates both the formative experience of election night Times Square and his summer 1906 move to the Lincoln Arcade Building studio that was opposite Sharkey's Athletic Club on Broadway. It's set not in slum streets or a backroom boxing club, but in the more respectable confines of a gymnasium, replete with orderly bleachers and lockers. It perhaps recalls a game for Ohio State, where Bellow played two seasons at right forward, or a more recent one for the West Side YMCA teams he joined on arrival in New York. In his groundbreaking essay on the, the boxing paintings, Robert Haywood establishes a sharp contrast between the clean and wholesome environment of the YMCA and Sharkey's packed, smoky club, between middle-class moralist perception of sport at the Y as an active route for integration into respectable society which valued a healthy and vital body, and of boxing clubs as sordid spaces where lowly men, men, many of whom were immigrants, engaged in dangerous, animal-like combat. Though stayed in comparison to the spectators later depicted at Sharkey's, in basketball already the crowd takes on grotesque qualities. Wrapped, illuminated faces emerge from the shadowy mass of watching bodies. Limbs and fists protrude from the group. The ball itself is hidden um, from view, locked in a fierce tussle between two players whose muscles strain and legs contort, whose bodies grind and collapse into one another in a dark, heavily worked passage of dense shading. If Bellows understood and wished to depict basketball as a wholly respectable activity, would he not have selected one of the more elegant, skillful phases of the game? Instead, working here as an insider, depicting a sport that he loved and that he excelled at, Bellows chooses to show animal-like combat, to show a moment in the game where skill gives way to brute strength when a team sport comes down to two struggling bodies. As a basketball player of many years standing, Bellows must have found himself in many clinches of this kind. His own body must have known such moments of intense physical impact. Such moments in the boxing paintings become, as David Peters Corbett has shown us in his recent catalogue essay, studies in abjection, in the debasement of the human body when subject to violent force. Basketball, the sport and the bellows drawing, is mild in comparison, but again suggests what bellows might have already known when he began to look at New York life. It's not just the ball that is hidden in this drawing, but also the faces of the grappling men, buried in one another's bodies in bellows dark crayon and ink work. The bourgeois respectability projected by the YMCA's masculine Christianity and by fraternal codes of gentlemanly conduct created opportunities for middle-class men to ex exercise the cruel, violent, and exuberant impulses that their working-class contemporaries played out and were castigated for on city streets. I want to close by looking briefly at two works that are in different ways closely related to I remember being initiated into the frat. In his February 12 letter to Taylor, Bellows states that he is at present rather interested in making black and whites. This is corroborated by the, year, the record book, which lists three drawings made in that month. Luncheon in the Park, I Remember Being Initiated into the Frat, and Splinter Beach. The movement between these two drawings can be understood in terms of difference. 
class difference manifested in environment, clothing, and arguably body type, the difference between recalling personal experience on the one hand and observing a scene that by 1912 was certainly familiar to the artist, but from which he was increasingly removed by age, wealth, and status. But by now, I hope we might also see some kind of equivalence. Both works are about the ways in which young men arrange themselves socially and physically, about the way an artist might compose their bodies in crayon and ink. Both depict a range of forms of physical proximity and interaction sanctioned and facilitated by the codes of play and sociability and initiation that structure college fraternities and street gangs. Bellows emphasizes the act of remembering in I Remember being initiated into the frat, in the title given to the drawing, in the way that the rec like a recollection in the mind's eye, the scene is of uneven clarity and intensity, and in the way that he describes the work to Taylor. That memory is a complicated, conflicted one, shaped by Bellows' mixed feelings about his time at Ohio State, by the cultural discourse surrounding college fraternities, and by the wide and varied experience the artist had encountered between the moment depicted in 1901-2 and the moment of its recollection in 1912. Did Bellows' time in the fraternity inflect and inform the way he saw the wild, violent play of New York streets, city streets? Or did those encounters with street children at play or fighters in Sharky's Ring provide insights that reshaped what it was that he recalled of college's violent rituals? <clears throat> Bellows returned to the scene um, of, and, and to the memory in 1917 to produce the lithograph initiation in the frat. While this was a period in which he raided his archive for earlier drawings for suitable compositions for lithography, as Robert Conway and others have shown, this was far from mechanistic process and changes made as the compositions were transferred to the stone were not arbitrary or unthinking. Moreover, Bellows pulled just 16 prints of initiation in the frat, far fewer than for any of his other lithographs, again suggesting a private joke or message intended for a select audience. Worked with the lithog lithog lithographer's crayon, Bellows' scene is darker and denser, arguably lacks the buoyant, jubilant air conveyed on an initial counter with the drawing. But this also means that individual acts of cruelty and submission are subsumed into a more generalized chaos. The beaten buttocks by the chapter house steps have all but disappeared. The downward pressure exerted on the boy's neck at bottom left seems less menacing. The lithograph's title de-emphasizes memory and personal involvement, and indeed the figure at the far right is less distinctly bellows-like and less marked out as a wry observer. The most significant change, I think, to the composition is made to another onlooker. In the 1912 drawing, a figure rests loafing against a tall tree to the rear of the main action, one hand casually in his pocket, the other raising a cigar cigarette to his mouth. By 1917, um, the 1917 lithograph, the man has thrown his hand across his face to shield his eyes. Had the events of the intervening years, including perhaps even the reports of German atrocities of ritualized violence and torture, made this scene harder for Bellows to look at? That this memory of fraternal initiation was an ongoing, ongoing process shaping and being shaped by subsequent experiences calls into question the easy dismissal of Bellows' college life as a state of innocence quickly forgotten and the characterization of middle-class identity as a staid, stable position from which to observe working-class life. Thank you. I think it's, a, a, I think it's a, <laughs> a very persuasive argument, and I'd only ask for clarification on one point. Um, when the observer appears in Bellows, when, when he puts himself into a, a painting, he tends to be detached. Um, isn't he involved there? On, on the one on the top left, is he not doing something? So here. Yeah, that one there. What's the figure that's supposed to be him doing? It's hard to say. He's not wielding any kind of weapon. He's not. I mean, he's, he's not. No, I, th I think okay. that it's it's hard to make out because I think that the, the bodies overlap here is kind of <laughs> one of the things I'm suggesting. I think that as I read it, and happy to take other thoughts, that this guy is there's a figure here who's got the, the paddle and there's a sort of truncheon here. But he, I mean, he's kind of disguised I, I, you, you, through the kind of forest of bodies. I don't think you can see much besides that he's. I think it looks like Bellows and he's, he's on the edge, but 
I, I, it's hard to make him as an active participant, mm. but he's very, clo he's very close to the action, and that's what I want to yes, say. He's, yes. he's, he's putting himself in that scene, if not wholly of it. Um, uh, the Rebecca Zuria's discussion of the uh, crowd at Polo, um, she goes on to, to like, and she makes a, a, an allusion to Whitman and to that kind of, of, of being of the crowd, but, uh, or in the crowd, but not of it. And I, 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 I kind of take that, that's where Bellows puts himself in, the, in, in this picture. And in the one on the right, what's he doing there? Again, kind of harder to make. I think it, it, the action seems to be the same and kind of inaction. Um, but it, it, it gets probably even harder to make out and harder to make him mm. as, make that figure as Bellows. Okay. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't agree that, that in those two, um, the Bellows figure is yeah. more involved than he is in most of the others? Yeah. No, I think I want to make an argument. I think he's complicit here. Mm. He's, okay. He's, he's, he's being initiated into the frat. He, you know, if we take it on the kind of biographical terms, he becomes part of this culture that he doesn't in so Crowd at Polo or the other scenes. He's, he's less directly involved, but I think he's, he's putting himself here, but not, you know, he's not hitting someone and he's not being hit. I think it'll be the, the key things I'd say about his involvement in the scene here. Mm, that, that's Thank really you. helpful. Thank you. John, that was fantastic. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I'm reminded of the Bellows figure here of the same figure in the drawing and lithographic combinations of the street, mm. where he's on the far right mm, looking mm. into a crowd, but it's a, it's a street crowd in the city rather than the frat. And mm. the prostitutes are parading in the front, and he's leering at them. Sure. So he's part of the action, but he's not entirely complicit in it, he's not mm. soliciting them, mm. but he's he's witnessing them. Sure. Um, and then the the very f odd lithograph of the th of which is called two girls, mm -hmm. which is seemingly from the, when you look at the drawing before the lithograph, you can see that it's taken inside a brothel. And there the question is, where is Bellows, mm. and what's he doing there? So, Bellows is in and out of the action, of of a of a lower caliber or lower class is is something that he is hinting at often in his work mm -hmm. but never giving us a definitive answer sure i i guess what i want to say or tr try to say is that we often see him putting himself close to those kind of scenes and i think that for good reasons we preserve an idea that he's that there's something is apart from them that one of the ways, I think, to think about Bellow's relationship to those city images is that, that through contrast with, 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 with Sloane, perhaps, who seems to be more can, closer, more, more has, has a great degree of proximity, that there is always, I think, a sense of, of distance, of ride detachment or something like that from, from Bellows. But I want to argue against that, in, to, to see that he's, he knows uh, that, that, that distinction that we're making between the kind of middle-class outsider and the person and the, th the scene that he he that the, the, or the things that he sees that we might take to be sordid or violent or or, or troubling is, is a false distinction that we see in, in in these kind of images that middle class life has understood the, the structures of middle class life facilitated all of those kinds of activities that Bellows we want to we, we sometimes say that he's at a distance from and I want to kind of collapse I'm, I'm trying to suggest that an image like this one and thinking about what a fraternity actually would have been collapses some of those ideas so that all of that kind of sanction of of um, illicit behavior that a fraternity allows is, is something that he at least knows and I don't want to say that how we can't say I don't think how how active a participant he is in that but he, it, it's part of his experience thank you hi Thank you. I'm, I'm interested, and I wonder if you can comment on the investment that art historians have in finding self-portraits in, <laughs> in artworks. And you know, people sure. point. I, I'm. Let me say at the start that I'm, I'm convinced by the visual evidence you've proffered that this really does look like Bellows. But beyond that, people find Bellows everywhere. Sure. A, an artist I worked on previously, Aikens, he's found in all sorts of paintings yeah. where there's limited evidence. So I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which we invest in the representational scene as if, if Bellows wasn't depicted, 
Is he less <laughs> complicit? He's, he's still chosen the subject. He's put this into circulation. He has a market for it. So what, can you talk a little bit about that, why it's important to us? Yeah, the preview of this question. Um, I think um, well, I, I've never particularly pursued this line of inquiry before, and the reason that I was led to do so is, is the title and the, the nature of this particular illustration that it's called, I remember being initiated in the, into the frat and into the fraternity. And that in that letter to, to Taylor, he's, he's making that sense of his, his presence there explicit. Um, so I, I agree that I'm, I don't feel that we, you know, do, in the many of Bellow's scenes, that I, I'm not sure what, do we see that domed head and it's a kind of, a, as we've said earlier, a, a signature in a lot of ways, but I don't know what it adds to, <laughs> to, to, to those images. I think in this case, it, it goes back to this idea of a kind of an intense, or what I take to be an intense moment of recollection that overtly thematizes recollection and his, comp and his place within it, that, that it matters here because Bellows was part, you know, he was part of that fraternity and he's acknowledging that. And I think the kind of symbolic act of sending it to the Macchio is, is interesting as well. He wants to place it there and so to, to kind of put himself into that, in, in, into that, that history of the fraternity. So I, I, I take the point completely that it, it <laughs> I don't know how, for, I wouldn't want to make a claim for each time Bellows puts himself into work, but I think in this instance, it, it strikes me as important. Well, if I, if I could join into that conversation, I would have to, first of all, I, I agree, that was a great talk. And, um, and but to take Martin's question, I don't think that I, I would agree that art historians have an invested have an invested interest in finding portraits of the artist, either direct or indirect, within the works. However, Bellows is very much, and, and Aikens, you gave those two examples. Well, Bellows was highly influenced by Aikens, and that's one of the things he borrows from Aikens, is that use of the self-portrait. But it goes back to Goya, those disasters of war were one of the most powerful ones of all. The caption, there's no picture of Goya within it, but the caption says, I was there, I saw this. And so there is a, a, a strand within realism that is about saying, I'm not making this up, these are things that I was a part of. I think what I, thinking, that, that I think that's helpful, and what I, I think I want to say is, it's about, that it's, it, for, for it, with, with this claim that I'm trying to make about Bellas, it's about something more actually than just being there. That he's, it's to do with that, I think that kind of bodily memory of physicality of presumably he was hit here or he's when he's I mean uh, I think the rules of basketball must have changed substantially uh, since 1906 but he's been in a kind of violent tussle he's, his body has felt those things and I think quite often in the discussion of the boxing paintings it's something happening to someone else at some remove and I, I think it does matter that he's he, he, this, that there's a visceral and bodily sense of experience of having experienced some of these kinds of things that very often we see as being, you know, that's that's what happened. You know, it's street kids that play in that rough way. Bellows knows that roughness in himself as well, and I think that that's why it maybe it matters more in the, for this argument. And, and just to continue, I mean, because you had that image on so long, and because we had just been talking about the war mm. paintings, and, and you sort of reference Abu Ghraib, or, well, you know, implied. I mean, it's it's a very very troubling image, mm. and it goes to the lynching image we saw earlier today from Martin, and so. You know whether this is sort of an inherent trait within Bellows or something in his culture. I mean, I think, I think we're all on to something to say that his Ohio State experience was not just simply benign rah rah. I mm. mean, you, you have shown it to be much more powerfully um, dark than that. The, the question I was going to ask, much more mundane. I don't know if you had said this before, John. The figure in the foreground, the sort of dandy observer, who looks like Robert Henry in the in that one. So we've got a Henry portrait too. <laughs> that seems to me, it definitely looks like Henry, but then he changes it quite a bit. Um, looks more like Bernard Berenson or something. <laughs> so I'm kind of wondering if you have any idea why he changed that figure. I don't have an idea on that. What I do, one of the things I didn't get to talk about uh, or didn't have space for is the, the thought of, of what else fraternal culture might mean to, to Bellows. That the Henry circle is a little like a frat in certain ways. It involves rituals of initiation and insiders and outsiders and a, a kind of group identity. That Bellows, I put him here as being in some ways distanced from or critical of fraternal culture, but he's also very fraternal himself. I, in, in, in the good, in positive senses of that too, those accounts of Bellows' pupils who 
kind of felt the warmth of the circle that he created. You mean Henry? But no, no, Bella's pupils. Oh, Bella's I think, you know, sorry, yeah. So, okay. the, I mean, so an example would be Elizabeth Olds, who in her um, kind of biographical discussion talks about being in, in, I guess, the New York School of Art, but not being in Bellows' class, but Bellows creates this kind of, of warmth around his students and invites anyone else who wants to be in it into that circle. So there's a kind of a sense of a different kind of fraternal culture that he takes with him. There's that very strange quote in the um, interview, I think, in International Studio with John Cornus, where he says that you know, he's asked to define his, his, his approach to art, and it's like manliness and, and love of the game. And it feels kind of, I mean, it kind of again fits with the kind of brash things that Henry Rice says, but it feels at odds with the way you might expect someone to talk about painting. But it really fits with the fraternal construction of masculinity, um, of manliness. And I think that maybe, you know, some of these things we've been talking about, the ways in which Bellows is the kind of, you know, the, uh, that, uh, that embodiment of healthy, <laughs> I'm really, really frightened about that word now, but that, 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 that comes from this, I think, in, in a way as well, that that's part of that, of that culture too. Um, I think it's kind of, kind of interesting. I thought it was a great talk. Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting how, um, we, as we've been discussing uh, Bellows the whole time, he's been, you know, he's known as quite a good athlete in college, yeah. but still, but still, he had to go through this hazing process, sure. and still, he didn't make it as a freshman. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe that disappointment might have led him to perceive it a little differently because he actually had to go through it, you know, a second time to make it. Sure. You know, yeah, just kind of wondering. It's, you know, it, it's it, it obviously our sources of biographical information here are quite limited and Morgan is, is and I think, I think uh, uh, Rollo Walter, <laughs> uh, Walter, Walter Brown, yeah, talks, I think he talks a little about the college experience and then there's some letters of, of one of, Bellows' classmates that do at length that this was that first year was painful that he was outside of the of, of, of the frat that is it, it, this kind of again is the, the biographical account is that Bellows is not a natural sportsman but becomes you know through endeavour makes himself um, a successful athlete um, and is rejected quite uh, 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 at school here in in in, in Columbus it suffers rejection and then that kind of leads o feeds over into his, that his first year at college, but he eventually kind of makes it. So absolutely, he's, he's seen all, all sides of that. But I also think that, that more broadly, I wanted to suggest that we're talking about, from this kind of biographical uh, sense of his own experience, which we can have limited access to. But what we do know is that there's a much broader kind of cultural discussion about college life. And, and um, that's not, I mean, I mentioned the post as an example, but the, the, there's a dozens of these of, of stories of, and it's a, it's a popular, um, a concern for novelists, for um, for cartoonists, for short story writers, that there's um, for um, sheet music. There's a huge kind of a trade of kind of humorous college songs that abounds at this time. That there's that there's a, a cultural sense of what of what fraternal life is that, that, that that's accessible or surrounds Bellows as well. And I think that some of these ideas about pain and rejection and the difficulty created by fraternities is present in the wider culture. Regardless, we don't have to just think about his personal experience of it. Um, I kind of have two questions, I guess. Number one is, um, uh, Charlie kept talking yesterday about the sort of ambivalence in, mm -hmm. in um, Bellows, and we other people have talked about it as well. But um, And we often think of, you know, we talk about Bellows being um, not invited to... Um, to pledge his first year, and he mm -hmm. felt very left out. And part of that also is that the Brownies, which was the group that he played baseball with, the rest of them were asked, <laughs> uh, were were invited to pledge. Um, so there's a there's a sense of being an outsider and not an insider. And I think that was very much part of Henry as well. But Bellows was in the frat for two years, so while one year he would have been, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hazed. The other year, he would have done that. Sure. And yeah. I, so <laughs> I'm wondering if, on the other hand, with the resurgence of, as you say, at the time of hazing and, and um, writing about frats, and that there's also in his memory yeah. that he was on the other side of that. And I, I also wonder if that's in, um, in the Macchio, or Macchio, you showed the, 
the um, uh, um, pledge, right, with the uh, blindfold. But in fact, the other side of that page is the yeah. Yeah. frat guy, and he's, I mean, he's, hang he's holding a rope, and he's in this cowled thing, and yeah. I mean, he's actually very frightening. Um, well, that, I mean, that, that sense of complicity, sure, that Bellows has <laughs> known both sides, is hit and possible. I mean, we don't know, but I mean, you know, presumably you could kind of sit out that process if you're a sensitive guy. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, the, you know, there is some suggestion of that kind of sense of him as, um, you know, that he has this kind of artist, the artist identity as well that comes through in his relationship with Joseph Taylor. And we, you know, by 1904, I mean, we, it's all speculation, but, you know, you know we don't, know what, what he did but my just my point is that he's been complicit in both sides of that and so when he then sees like kids throwing each other off the dock he's got some kind of sense of that of that what it is to be involved in rough and tumble of that kind he's not always just been outside of it hmm. um hi thanks for the lecture i was very impressed by it um i would like to mention goya once more sorry about that but I couldn't stop thinking about these designs he made for the tapestries that would decorate the um, royal palace in Madrid. And they had this joyful character. And in one of them, you see the central scene, um, mm -hmm. as, as in this drawing you were discussing. Um, and I was thinking how interesting is um, the, um, the combination of this, let's say, joyful image in the center with other images that you could see in um, the drawings he made for the series Los Desastres de la Guerra. Um, for instance, um, Professor Lubin was showing one in which two bodies were hanging from a tree and they were um, like um, dismembered. Mm. So you could relate it to the um, body hanging from the tree um, in the background. I don't know, I think this adds um, layers of, m of meaning to the drawing if you think how busy was um, Bellows with the work of Goya and, mm. and, and how Goya was um, using his work to uh, introduce social criticism both in these designs for the tapestry and later on with the series on the war. Um, no, I think that... that, uh, that one, so Henry would have, by that point, introduced Bellows most likely to, to Goya and, and others as work. So we see that as another kind of sense of, of the distance and the difference between the Macchio illustrations and what we, what we, we see here, absolutely. Um, the stranger, the thing that I've troubled, or the, the influence that I find difficult is um, in the letter to Taylor in a piece I uh, mentioned yesterday but didn't quote today, is that he, he says that this is an attempt to merge his own, uh, to, to com combine his own style with that of Charles Keane, to talk about an early punch cartoons. And I've struggled, but I can't, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can see some bellows here and I, I find it hard to, to see Keane here. So if anyone can help me, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Yeah. But no, thank you. I mean, I think in that, 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 that sense of, of absolutely of, of, of contrast between the, the, the flung figure and the hung figure is, is, a, is a really interesting one. Thank you. Uh, I don't need to stand up there. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming this year. And uh, next year, the symposium is going to be on art and money. We're doing a contemporary, or our contemporary curator, uh, Tyler Can, is doing a show called In Underline. I always feel like I'm saying the person once known as Prince, right? It's In Underline, um, or In mm, we trust, uh, but it deals with contemporary art and money and issues of value and trust and, and um, worth. So we'll focus the symposium on that. Um, I wanna thank all the speakers and the guests for coming. Um, it makes a fabulous um, symposium with the give and take and um, go home and have a great time. <laughs>